Welcome and thank you for joining us. In this session, we're gonna talk a little bit about how to build a successful security culture. My name is Jenny Brinkley. I'm a senior manager in AWS Security. And my job is to build programs on security and education and awareness. And our team's primary goal is to make security easier for our customers and our people at AWS. And today we're gonna to talk about four areas that you can consider in your business around behaviors, mechanisms, education, and takeaways. But joining me for the conversation is Steve Schmidt. He is our VP of Security Engineering, our Chief Information Security Officer at AWS. And we're gonna talk a little bit about our approach and thinking about how we take on building a, secure, a positive security culture, but also how you can do it, even if you don't sit inside the security organization. So with that, I'd like to welcome Steve. And Steve, Thank out you. of the gate, Talk a little bit about your role as CISO and maybe a little bit about your background uh, prior to joining AWS. Sure, so uh, I was in the FBI in, uh, from the late 90s on, and one of the jobs I had in the FBI was intelligence analysis. And it was a, a business of acquiring a lot of information from a variety of places around the world and then comparing it to information we had in the US. And like everybody else at that point in time, we had a bunch of file systems that were set up on these big NAS boxes and, or block storage devices. And we kept filling them up and they were just a real, real pain to operate. Huge operational overhead associated with them. And we saw this thing called Amazon S3 that came out in uh, probably what, 2006-ish and said, that's what we need. Uh, it's an object store, something where I handed a piece of data, it hands me a URL, and if I need that data back, I hand it the URL and it hands me the data. Interestingly, I didn't join AWS to be in the security organization. In fact, at that point in time, we used the security organization that the, the retail company now has. And my first job in AWS was running a software development team that built products, built services uh, for AWS. And I think that is part of why I'm good at my job now, because I have literally been in the position of my internal customers. I know what it is like to build software and to build and operate services. And it turned out to have been just an awesome, awesome job opportunity. And I've enjoyed it ever since. I've been doing it over 10 years. And the reason I think it's so exciting is because it is not only building and operating a security organization that operates at a scale that's nobody's seen before, but it's building and operating a culture that is very unusual in the security world. And that's something I'm most proud of is building the right culture in the organization. And I think um, that's one of the things that we should talk about quite a bit today. You know, in our business, when we talk about the goals that we set of being aspirational, what are some of those um, behaviors that our customers should think about when they're developing aspirational goals, specifically around a, sec a security program? Sure. So security programs usually come in in two types. There's the the sort of here are the things I'm going to do today because I know there are problems that I've got to go tackle. And then on the other side of that, there are these long term strategic projects which may take three or four years to accomplish. And while they're both necessary, they're missing some important middle steps between the two. Uh, one of the things that I believe in in really strongly is incremental progress. So rather than trying to go with a big bang program that, that doesn't complete for a bunch of years, um, I try and have our teams accomplish something significant on a very short interval. So what I'm talking about there is things like goals which say automate 80, that's eight zero percent of a particular kind of security work. And the reason I focus on numbers like that is if you aim for 100%, which seems like a logical kind of, of goal, um, you're, you're gonna have this very protracted, stretched out situation. And in the meantime, you're not necessarily gonna be able to take advantage of the changes that you have made. So we aim for things that are incremental, that are progressive, that are measurable, and more importantly, are attainable in a relatively short period of time. So maybe a couple months. And when you are setting those goals with a team and maybe dig in a little bit about being progressive around security, people hear that and they might say to themselves, security being progressive. Are there some things that you've done within the business to get them to think about what progressive means around a goal? 
Sure, so progressiveness for us means always making progress towards the goal that our service teams, our customers, want to achieve. This is not about what the security team itself wants to do, but ensuring that we're always helping our customer teams, our internal teams, make progress towards their own goals, their own accomplishments. Uh, it's important for two things. One is that's the way business progresses, and that's the way our, our services are launched to our customers on the outside. But it's also a way of encouraging the service teams to want to talk to us, as opposed to viewing us as obstructions to their ability to launch services or products. And that is one thing I really do appreciate about our business is that we, you know, in some security organizations, they're viewed as the department of no. Uh, sometimes you get a visual of a hall monitor with a clipboard. But in the relationship that we do have with the service teams, it's, it's one of making good choices, helping them before they write a line of code. And I think also too, it's the demystification of what security represents for the business, that we're here to be an enabler and to be really communicative, in fact, over communicative of how we work and the expectations that we put in place as the teams are, the service teams are building and creating. When we do have opportunities within AWS, Maybe talk a little bit about how AWS deals with security opportunities. So when we're thinking about those behaviors around that. So dealing with security opportunities involves ensuring that you have the right goals, but it also involves ensuring you have the right measurements. So for example, when we talk about fostering a culture in an organization, a culture is fostered not only by tenets and by goals, but also by the way that you measure the progress of your organization. So for example, if your job is application security, that is ensuring that you build and launch services that are secure by default, that are built properly, that will withstand the test of time, how do you measure the way your team as a security professional interacts with the service teams that you're serving? I suggest the right way to do that is the same way that we measure customer service interactions, where our service personnel are talking to our customers on the outside. It's, are you happy with the interaction that you just had? Did I solve your problem in a reasonable period of time? Did I give you the tools to do your job more effectively or more easily? Those are the kinds of questions that we ask ourselves, and we ask our customers to answer to ensure that we know how we're being perceived on the outside. Steve, I've heard you talk about intentional data policies before. What do you mean by that when you say intentional data policies and setting them? Sure, so intentional data policies to me means you're making a very definite choice on how you store, where you store, and how you protect information. Too often we hear from customers that when they've had a bad day, it's because somebody said something like, well, I'll put the data over here for now, and I just need to give people administrative access to make it easy to do something in a short term. And both of those are unintentional decisions that lead to potential problems. So intentional data policies should be things like, whenever I store this kind of data, it should always be in this place, or with these rules around it, or with this logging attached to the work. And it's important there that for data that you need to protect, and for most of us, that's, that's large portions of our data estate now, um, you need to make sure that your teams not only know where to put it, how to store it, how to protect it, but also have tools that make it easy for them to do the right thing. I think when we've seen problems in the past, it's not because someone makes a, a, a bad decision intentionally. They don't say, you know what, I'm gonna be sloppy and, and do this thing that, that led me to a problem. What they did is they're like, I, I need to get my job done. And, and this is the simplest way to do it is just to put it over here. And then data is accessed by an unauthorized party and everybody has a bad day. So this is one of those situations where you want to give people not only the rules and the instruction on how to do things right, but also the tools that make it easy for them to do the right thing. And as a result, you'll be happier as a security professional, your customers will be happier that they can get their job done and they can do it more easily. And tools take investment. So there has to be somebody whose job it is, is to make that investment and continue to make those investments over time. So what and, and how critical do you think is that communication with senior leadership? Sure, I think it depends on your individual business, obviously, but we made a very, very specific choice when we designed the security culture at Amazon by starting off by putting the security team reporting to the CEO. 
That was done about uh, probably 10 years ago. And we did that intentionally because we wanted the company to view security as the top priority for the business. It is something that is super critical for us. If we don't do it right, our customers have a bad day. If our customers have a bad day, we don't have a business. So we started off by the structural design of the organization, and then we continue on into the way we operate security. So everybody's heard Andy, our CEO, talk about security being job zero. So the first thing that we do every day and, and how we operate and build our business. But it also is reflected in the day-to-day -day operations of the organization, where we've got a security team who reports to the CEO, but security is not just the security team's job. In fact, Andy makes it really clear to our service teams that they own the security of their customers' information because they own their business. And security is a fundamental, non-negotiable portion of being successful in their business. So as a result, you've got the leader setting the strategic setup for the company with security as the, the top of the rung. You've got the leader reinforcing on a regular basis that the service teams own the security of their organization and their services and are responsible for it. And then every week we spend time with the security leadership and Andy and the senior vice presidents in the company, and we go through tactical security issues to make sure that not only is he aware of what's going on and agrees with the path that we've chosen, but also it's an opportunity for him to reinforce with all of our staff members the criticality of getting security right in the organization. And then one of the things that I really do appreciate about the business and also the space you create of how we practice escalations. So maybe talk a little bit about the importance of identifying the problem, making individuals feel comfortable about sharing when something goes wrong, Sure, so for us, first of all, I'll, I'll define what escalation means. Escalation is, is the process of ensuring that the right people know about the problem at the right point in time. Um, so when you talk to some organizations, there's this, this question of, well, do we tell this person or not? You know, They don't really care about it, so we don't really let, need to let them know. And escalation for us is just a fundamental part of the way the company operates. And it actually goes all the way back to one of our, our corporate values, uh, which is the fact that, that leaders dive deep and owners drive deep into the details of the way the business operates. And without all of the details, you cannot make good decisions about what's going on, how to make a business function effectively, et cetera. And so escalation is the concept of somebody seeing something that causes them to go, hmm, is that right? And then instead of sitting on it, making sure the right people know about it and creating a, self, a safe culture where employees not only feel like they can do something, but they're rewarded for doing something is critical to getting the right visibility. So if you think about the contrast to sort of the, the old world of shoot the messenger, well, you identified a security problem, therefore, mm, bad. Uh, that, that discourages people from bringing things forward. Um, when in fact, my job as a leader is to thank people who've identified things and brought them forward for our attention. I think one of the biggest pieces that I've been so curious about and how we've been able to pull on this more, and I'm sure you're hearing this in, in lots of conversations, is as we've been moving from work from home and that area of, of how we educate and how we still uh, get individuals to do the right thing, to feel empowered to do the right thing. So maybe talk a little bit about how that education piece, how that encouragement of practicing escalations uh, has, has gone into this kind of work from home environment. You know, everybody's, either kids are Zoom schooling or other things are happening in the background. So how do you, how do you think about that in terms of just the education aspect with work from home as it relates to security culture? Education for security is, is one of those areas where there's a lot of back and forth on, on how to be successful at it. What we found works really well for us is creating educational content, and your team is the driver of this uh, across the company, that is engaging and succinct. And I use the word succinct intentionally because too often people think about measuring educational content in terms of number of minutes. And the more minutes, the better. You must be more educated because there were more minutes involved. I, I firmly disagree with that. And in fact, 
um, for a lot of the required content across the company, I put goals in place for reducing the number of minutes it takes to deliver that content because more time does not mean more value. In fact, in many situations, it means less retention of the content. Um, sort of case in point, uh, we've compressed a lot of our yearly security training down into a few minutes, but those few minutes are incredibly engaging. They're humorous. They are things that, that have Easter eggs hidden in them. And as a result, our employees talk about that content constantly in our email forums, which does exactly what I want as a security leader. It's something that they're not only seeing, but they're replaying to others. And it's because we made it funny. And it's because we made it something that they enjoyed doing as opposed to had to sit through because some guy said there's some security they should learn. You know, and it's, it sounds like a joke, but it's actually super, super important to our ability to get the messages across to people. And you talk about COVID and we all have to sort of deal with the, the work from home situation. And it used to be that we could get some of that security education in the sort of hallway conversations or the stuff that happened in the coffee. Um, and that doesn't happen anymore. So now it's even more important than ever before that the content we do deliver to our employees is engaging and it's effective in the way that we deliver things. So I know one of the other big areas that we're really focused on is identifying security talent for, for People watching, uh, I'm sure you have a hard time finding security people. Uh, in AWS, we're really lucky. We have individuals that love to come here because of the size of problem they get to solve, but that also means that we are still trying to find talent. So in thinking about those security engineering roles, specifically, Steve, and knowing the gap that's out there, talk a little bit about how you're thinking about solving for the future for that problem and also some of maybe the programs we have in place. Sure, so I think the, the stats, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but what was it about, uh, about 3 million additional security engineering staff needed next year? Somewhere yeah. around that? Uh, there is no way that quantity of people is gonna come out of universities. It's simply the flow is just not there. And we all need these staff. They're super hard to find. They're hard to retain because they're very marketable. And so beyond building the right environment for them to, to work in and giving them the right tools, the right backing, et cetera, we need to think about how we can develop people outside of the traditional, here's the person with a bachelor's degree who came out of an institution focusing on computer security. And one of the areas that, that we found very effective is focusing not on the technical skills, which is where most people start, but instead focusing on the way the person thinks and their curiosity. And what I mean by that is I can take somebody who has an aptitude to learn and an inherent curiosity that makes them ask, why? Why did that happen? Why is that different than all the others? This one doesn't look like the others do. Something is off. That kind of curiosity is critically important to having the right kinds of skills that we look for. Now, certainly you need the technical skills to implement something appropriately and to do the analytics and to build the software and so forth. But I can teach a lot of those skills to somebody. So to give you some examples there, um, we've had just great, great results with people coming out of our customer service organization for two reasons. One is they know how our customers feel. So they have that inherent desire to please the customer on the other hand. And they're doing a lot of, hmm, huh, why did that occur? and answering those kinds of questions. So we can then build them into the security engineering staff that we're looking for. The same thing in the physical security space. The people who are really good in that space often are asking, why is this person doing that thing? Why are they trying to do this right now? And we got to tie that back to our, our fundamental job, which is protecting information. But guess what? Machines don't attack machines, at least not yet. People cause machines to do things. And so somebody who is very interested in the way human beings think about stuff or behave is incredibly useful to us in the security space. And we can teach them the technical skills they need. Okay, Steve, Zero Trust has been really buzzy these days. Uh, so when we're talking about Zero Trust and when you're talking to customers, how are you talking about the principles around Zero Trust? To us, zero trust means that you are not relying on a network perimeter as your primary defense point anymore. 
And it's something that we have been pushing for quite a long time. In fact, since the beginning of Amazon EC2, every virtual machine came with its own firewall by default with all the security groups closed. And that's in such contrast to most on-premises data centers where every machine on a network has access to every other machine on the network. Um, but to us, zero trust means pushing down the security perimeter to the smallest possible component, ideally individual data elements, if you can get down to that point. And then in the converse of that, opening up access to those individual data elements from wherever the user who's authorized happens to be. So it's no longer that I have to be on a VPN, for example, but instead a situation where perhaps my phone has an agent on it that can inform our authentication and authorization system that my phone is in an approved state for patching. Uh, it doesn't have any software on it that's inappropriate. That I'm in a physical location where it's appropriate for me to be. I'm not in a country where it's against the law for me to do the work that I'm, I'm interested in and it's not a high threat area, for example. Um, and that indeed I'm behaving the way that I normally behave. You know, is this really the way Steve acts? And anchoring that trust in hardware components that have a great deal of repeatability in their ability to discern, is this actually the right person? So for example, on a mobile device using the secure enclave that's present in the device to, to give a signal to the authentication and authorization system that this is really the right person. So for us, Zero Trust is about building a set of different kinds of controls that all together allow us to either permit or deny access to individual components of data for individual people based on their work, where they are, what they're using to access the device, the time of day, day of week, location they're at in the world. And it allows much, much better fine-grained control of information when done properly. So with that all being said, uh, we're pretty much at time. So I just want to thank Steve for being here. Hopefully you've learned some things uh, and, and found some things that were interesting out. I don't know, Steve, do you have any parting words you want to share out? I think the most important thing that I'd like people to take home today is that our business should be a positive one. It should be about how do we make people's lives better? How do we make them more effective and more efficient at their job? And how do we ensure that Every single day, we make incremental progress towards our goals as opposed to waiting for a big bang. And also security is the department of yes. We love to empower. So for those that do not sit in the security org, I challenge you to go schedule a virtual coffee, get some time with your security leadership, understand their business objectives, and just find out the simple ways of how can we be communicating more effectively together? How can we partner in sharing what those visions and, and aspects look like? You can learn more about what we're also doing inside of AWS Security at the AWS Security blog. It's a great place for information. Uh, but again, thanks everybody for taking the time out to take part in this session today and take care. Thanks, Jenny.